Hi, everyone. My name is Eva Salinas. It is a pleasure to be hosting this discussion today uh, about after the pandemic, building back better in this UN decade of action. Of course, we're, we're delving into what COVID-19 means for the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and uh, first, we do have a presentation from Jeffrey Sachs. We'll be taking 30 minutes to, to respond to his remarks, to have a moderated discussion. There will be time for uh, questions from all of you who are joining us afterwards. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen and, um, and play a Dr. Sachs presentation. And, and then we'll join you back here afterwards. Uh, it's just a, a few minutes long and, um, and get started with this, this discussion. Greetings, I'm Jeff Sachs, Director of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and I'm so proud of SDSN Canada and delighted to be part of SDSN Canada's conference this year. It certainly is occurring at the most extraordinary moment of modern history. Uh, I've been asked to be a provocateur, and I'm, I'll be provocative, uh, I can assure you. Uh, because I will use superlatives that I think are justified uh, by this moment. Uh, in fact, I'll start by repeating the observation made by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres that this is the most uh, extraordinary global crisis since World War II. And I would add that it is the most extraordinary economic crisis since the Great Depression. Uh, indeed, uh, the way we're going, we are going to have another Great Depression. Uh, we're not doing what we could be doing on almost any front, uh, whether it's public health uh, or economic response uh, or financial response. And so uh, we're going to see on our current trajectory a, a tremendous multiplication of the damages from this virus. Under any circumstances, COVID-19 would have been a very serious crisis because this is a deadly new pathogen for humanity, one for which humans have no acquired immunity from past rounds of infection, at least so far as we know. The infection fatality rate is uh, somewhere around uh, 0.9 of 1% according to most estimates. That's uh, roughly an order of magnitude uh, higher than a serious flu. Uh, so we're in for a lot of deaths and a lot of illness. Having said that, uh, epidemics are controllable uh, if they are addressed quickly, urgently, and systematically. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of uh, relative success stories of containing this epidemic, uh, especially in the Asia Pacific region. I think it's probably right to say that countries that battled uh, heavily with SARS uh, were, are more prepared and are uh, doing better than countries that didn't have SARS outbreaks. Canada, somewhere in the middle of that story, I uh, was certainly uh, hit by SARS, uh, and it is doing better than the United States, uh, to be sure. But it is in the Asia Pacific uh, where we see the most dramatic success stories. China battled this epidemic down uh, from the outbreak in Wuhan nearly to zero, uh, a tremendous public health accomplishment. Uh, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Australia, and New Zealand, all to a varying extent uh, have contained the epidemic, albeit with some very serious outbreaks. Uh, but the question is whether outbreaks lead to generalized community transmission or whether they are contained after the outbreaks. Uh, Korea had one terrible outbreak. Singapore had a terrible outbreak in the migrant worker community, but uh, they battled them down. Vietnam has done extraordinarily well. Well, if you turn to our part of the world, uh, the North Atlantic countries of Western Europe, Canada and the United States, uh, with varying levels of control, we've done much, much worse 
than the Asia Pacific region. Uh, death rates per million are much higher, uh, case rates much higher, uh, ongoing uh, epidemic transmission uh, continues. There has been chit chat about the uh, battle between economics and health. This is wrong. Basically, uh, it's not whether you have an economy or you keep people alive. The only way to have an economy that functions is to suppress the epidemic itself. As long as the epidemic is uh, transmitting at epidemic rates, the economy cannot function. Uh, that's why the United States is entering depression territory. Uh, we'll have 20% unemployment rates or higher. We'll have a budget deficit of 20% of GDP. And there's no real light in this right now. Even though transmission rates are down because of the lockdown, they're not down because of public health replacing the lockdown. In other words, we don't have targeted testing, tracing, quarantining, uh, symptom monitoring, hygienic uh, practices replacing the generalized lockdown yet because we don't have uh, a sane federal government to put that in place. The result is the economic crisis is extraordinarily serious and getting worse. Very quickly, let me say that for much of the developing world, it's a very dangerous and mixed picture. In South America, bad and getting worse. Brazil is governed something like the United States. Bolsonaro is a really a profoundly ignorant and irresponsible man. Uh, Ecuador and Peru are being hard hit by the epidemic. Venezuela has been crushed by US sanctions. Uh, we're in trouble uh, in South America. <laughs> in uh, other parts of the world, it's hanging in the balance. Can India keep this under control? Pakistan seemingly, seemingly uh, will not be able to keep this under control. What's going to happen in Russia where the epidemic is surging? The, the death reports are very low, but that's because of the way that Russia classifies deaths, not because of uh, a low number of deaths, in fact. Uh, what about Indonesia, a country of 200 million people battling uh, to keep this down, but apparently with the epidemic spreading? In Africa, huge risks in Nigeria, uh, DRC, Ethiopia, South Africa, uh, the big populous countries uh, hanging in the balance. Uh, we need a strong, strong WHO response. So naturally, our fool in chief, our psychopath in chief in the United States cuts off US funding for WHO. This is par for the course. Uh, we're in the hands of a kind of madness. Uh, at the same time as we're trying to battle the epidemic. I fear that there will be a significant financial crisis worldwide with many countries pushed to default. Uh, this is not inevitable, but it becomes more likely by the day, as long as the United States is uh, as incoherent and weak as it is. Uh, I have been impressed by the leadership of the UN agencies in responding, but I am worried, of course, that they don't have the strong backing that they need from the major countries, starting with the United States itself. We need the IMF to be greatly enhanced in its financial capacity. Its portfolio is just too small. Its lending capacity, far too small for this crisis. Uh, that means that uh, much of the financing is left to the private sector, which will panic and run rather than refinance uh, the debts of developing countries. Everywhere, government budgets are going to be in disarray. Uh, this means uh, a lot of borrowing, and it means in developing countries, depreciating currencies, rising food prices, risks of uh, political instability. Well, I said I was going to be provocative. Uh, I'm a worried person uh, that we are not getting this under control, starting with the United States itself, with a U.S. president uh, who would be the wrong person at any time to be U.S. president, but is definitely the wrong person to be president uh, in the midst of a global crisis that requires a systematic, rational uh, approaches and collaboration 
and cooperation for global success. Uh, we in academia uh, have a special role to play to analyze, think, and put forward practical uh, proposals based on deep knowledge, not uh, only on uh, you know, scattered ideas, but on uh, hard work of how we can uh, cooperatively overcome this crisis. Uh, in the United States, uh, SDSN, SDSN USA, uh, we're uh, going to put forward uh, a recovery program based on uh, essentially a decarbonization of energy strategy. This is the only way forward. Well, thank you for letting me join you. I'm looking forward to working with you as very close colleagues as we make our contribution to uh, using the sustainable development goals and the Paris Climate Agreement as a pathway out of this very, very deep crisis. As our first priority, SDG3, let's keep people alive. Let's use the public health that we know, uh, but also let's remember SDG 17, Global Partnership, because we're going to need uh, extraordinary and creative means uh, to uh, avoid calamity. Thanks so much. I look forward to hearing the results of your important conference and warmest regards and all best wishes. Hello, everyone, and hello to everyone joining us for this discussion. Um, as I mentioned, in case you, you joined a few minutes late, my name is Eva Salinas. I am going to be moderating this discussion. We don't have a lot of time, uh, so I do want to dive right in. Um, just very, very briefly, um, we'll have a few minutes for uh, discussion questions from the audience. Um, so if there is a Q&A chat box. Please put your questions in there if you have any as we go along or towards the end. Um, and also there is a breakout room following this discussion at 12.45 um, uh, so we, we, for the audience to engage on this topic to keep the discussion going. Um, so please, uh, by all means, join us there. Um, obviously, I want to, um, to introduce uh, all of our, our panelists here. Um, we have first um, Céline Campagna, a climate and health researcher with the Institut National de Santé Publique de Québec. John MacArthur, a Brookings Senior Fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program, and Kathleen Potvin, a professor in the Department of Biology at McGill University and a Canada Research Chair in Climate Change Mitigation and Tropical Forest. Uh, thank you all for, for joining me. Um, just uh, as I've mentioned, uh, we have the discussion afterwards, so let's just dive right in um, and, and responding to some of the things that Jeffrey Sachs mentions. Um, around the impact of, that COVID-19 is having on the areas covered by the SDGs. I mean, he mentions the, the obvious priority being SDG 3, good uh, health and well-being. Um, he also paints a grim picture on the impact on poverty levels, on unemployment rates, economic growth. We also know that the impact uh, is, has been disproportionate already on women, on low income and racialized communities. And it has the impact, the potential to impact the global south much harder. And we're already seeing that already in areas such as food security. So just to start off, I'd like to ask each of you, uh, what do you think are the specific SDG, SDGs that are going to be hardest hit and that will need to be prioritized as we move forward? So Kathleen, why don't, why don't you start with us? For that one. I felt that was a bit of a hard question <laughs> since in my brain anyway sustainability is everything is linked so if everything mm. is linked it becomes very hard to pick so I would say I would pick 17 but uh, of course maybe some are less important um, for me the poverty one SDG one is key we see everywhere that uh, poor as you said and marginalized are hardest hit that brings me to five gender. Of course, it's a health crisis, so number th uh, number three. Uh, in Quebec, very much, and I would imagine elsewhere, it's related to decent work, so NDG number eight. It is very much an issue with cities. We see everywhere that cities are much harder hit than rural, so 11, sustainable cities. And yes, I'm quite concerned with the global partnership. Um, I would uh, end by just saying what is one of my lessons of this crisis is no one will be safe if 
not everyone is safe. So it is about connectivity. It's the safety of each one of us depends of the safety of everyone around us. And so it's really a moment to think collectively, globally, and not leave anybody behind. John, do you have any to add to, to those? Yeah, suggest a slightly different way of thinking about the question. And uh, first, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be together ensemble with uh, so many wonderful people across Canada. I wish we could be together at Laval, <laughs> but uh, around the world I see in the chat room. So it's exactly the type of thing which is the upside of this too, is that we can find ways to connect and innovate uh, to bring people together. I think the instinct to prioritize goals is a very natural one, but maybe not quite the right one. Because for me, the goals are more of a, a mental checklist to recap all the things we need to be thinking about because there isn't one versus the other. And it's exactly as Catherine just said, we're all in this together. This is a very universal crisis. It's not an intellectual one for most people. Most people are grappling with this in their own households, in their own families. Uh, huge swaths of society are not even able to go to their own workplace or have lost their jobs uh, across many, many sectors. So I think we have to resist the temptation to say, well, what? Who first and what first? I think we certainly have, you know, priority for the elderly, no question, as top uh, populations at risk. We have many marginalized communities that are getting ultra left behind in this, and we're seeing that uh, as the through line of the goals of always leaving no one behind. But when I go through it, I say, well, poverty, we're certainly getting a big hit. Hunger, we're certainly getting a big hit. Uh, health, of course. Uh, although, you know, all the elective surgeries that aren't getting done are uh, a huge question, too. Uh, education. We have one and a half billion kids around the world not in school right now because everything's shut down. Gender. Uh, an unusually for a, an economic turn back, it's disproportionately being borne by women in this case uh, around the world. We have uh, the jobs goal, of course. We have inequalities getting amplified around the world. We have, so, so I, my point being, I don't want to have to choose. I want to be prompted to think through all of these because that's what the goals are about. And I'm so thankful that there are people who have dedicated their lives to each of these mm -hmm. and that the goals are about forcing us to think how to connect together. Very quickly, I would just add, there are some possibilities for upside and it's a very, very difficult situation innovations like this one, in terms of how we can connect people afresh. Uh, we have the environmental challenges that have been brought to a new attention, which is an opportunity if it doesn't get missed. There's a lot of deregulation happening around the world to uh, you know, scale back environmental protections in order to give a space for jobs. You know, that could go either way in many cases. Uh, but there's a broad awareness of the interface between natural systems and human systems right now. So that's an opportunity. Uh, and crucially, I would say, we have an immediate kind of respond mindset right now, which is crucial. We're starting to hear more and more about the rebuild and how build back better is a, a phrase many people are using. But then we also have to think about the reset. Uh, and I, some call, I'm happy to talk about this more later, but even reimagine what are the opportunities that this is bringing up where we can think through as we rebuild, as we think about say 2021, how can we start to get to a reset so we're not in such a fragile and vulnerable place across all these goals to begin with? Thank you. Celine, anything to, to add there? Uh, I would like, uh, well, first to thank uh, the organizers of uh, Together Ensemble too. And uh, well, they, I wouldn't say they stole my punch, but uh, I, I, I'm thinking uh, the same way as uh, Catherine and John on Bali, but health, what, what is health? Health has a uh, lot of determinants and uh, those factors they come from poverty, economic status, education, gender equality, uh, all, all the goals are connected to health, let's say. It, 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 for me, it's not just one health and I think the way uh, DODD3 uh, was designed is to ensure that the health systems were in place, uh, well-funded, 
so that we can uh, help the people when they need it. But to guarantee the health of everyone, like all the, all the rest uh, needs to be uh, um, attained. Let's say that uh, in Canada, lots of people, lots of communities don't have access to uh, drinking water, safe drinking water still in Canada. So if we don't start from the bottom, and now the pandemic is just as uh, John and Catherine to told us, just putting a pressure, uh, an extra pressure on all those determined. So it's going to be difficult to go back to a, uh, go back or, or even uh, improve the, the health of the population starting from here. But we have an opportunity to look forward and to, um, to, to uh, let's say, to influence uh, the deciders right now. Uh, they have a good um, ear uh, to the science now. They take uh, well, not in every country, but I would say in Canada in general, uh, they they listen to scientific uh, data. They listen to the scientifics, uh, like in public health and in the, all the sectors. So that so we have this um, uh, this channel which is open to uh, let the, to to data and uh, uh, I would say um, decision driven data. So let's uh, cap capture this moment and let the, uh, we, we have to force this channel to stay open for the decision uh, with the economy that will, uh, to, to um, uh, when they will reopen the economy so that the economy uh, opening will be uh, data driven so that like everybody, nobody will be left behind even nobody and for me the environment is it's not somebody but we have to guarantee the the health of the environment so that we can guarantee to the health of the population this is a one health concept well and, and on that note Celine uh, you know the SDGs already existed as a framework and they were already centered around cooperation interconnectedness uh, around building inclusive communities so you know, you, you mentioned briefly, but could you elaborate a bit? Are you seeing uh, any new discussions or uh, even within whether that's the healthcare sector, uh, you know, the connections between health and socioeconomic factors, like you mentioned, um, or are those links being seen more clearly from a general public point of view or policymakers now more than ever? What do you see that's new here that's coming out of the pandemic? Um, I don't see anything new and I don't think it's going to be changing. Uh, but on a on a global scale, health population is uh, really related to uh, the economic status of an individual and in, uh, uh, of the population. So this is known, you know, be a better wealth is a better health in general. But uh, I, I don't think it's going to be changing with uh, the pandemic or the after COVID. Uh, in fact, I'm really worried because uh, uh, in what the history is telling us is that uh, the, the health sector, and especially the public health sector, will be um, uh, less funded. Uh, often, that's what, and the the um, the infrastructures will be more funded because it's a lot of job. It's a quick job and a well-paid job. So, uh, and let's hope. Let's say that uh, the. The, the infrastructure that will be funded will be uh, like sustainable first, like mobility kind of a driven uh, uh, infrastructure, and that they're going to be open to think that if you protect the health and uh, fun, still fund the health sector and especially public health, uh, which is there to guarantee the protection and to guarantee uh, uh, to, to see to see the problem coming because that's the whole thing. Uh, if you don't guarantee this funding to see the other problem coming, and there will be other problems with a zoonotic, zoonotic disease, like COVID is a zoonotic disease. So it, other with climate change and the change, the global change will, will, will come other problems. And if we don't see it coming, uh, it's gonna be a, a problem. But often they, they like to, uh, to cut in those sectors, especially after COVID, because the health sector uh, got a lot of money right now. So it's going to be tempting to shut, 
to shut this money out. Well, and, and we'll get to recovery plans and, and innovation in recovery plans in, in a few minutes. Um, but Kathleen, I, I, speaking of, you know, the how do we make sure that that point of the interconnectedness is, is, is maybe made louder or how do we um, ensure that, you know, there's, there's lessons learned here? Um, those connections between climate change and health, um, you know, climate change, obviously, uh, and, and environmental issues already had this interconnectedness, uh, you know, so naturally in that argument. But where does that momentum for climate action fit in here right now? Well, for me, obviously, climate change fits in the, the, the post-COVID response and the reinvestment. And I think, um, again, that what is this crisis is illustrating is this connectivity and the need for resilience. Uh, it's also showing very clearly, as we mentioned, the link between poverty and, 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 and the, the consequences of that on the health of everyone everybody else. So I think it's important to remember climate change is also a health hazard. Maybe people forget that. At the beginning of the crisis, I went back and looked at figures. In 2010, Moscow was uh, subjected to a heat wave. 10,000 people died over two weeks. That's COVID equivalent. In 2003, there was a heat wave in Europe. 70,000 people died of heat wave climate related. World Health Organization is saying there's 200,000, 250,000 premature death per year due to climate change. So people can now maybe grasp a bit better the magnitude of that. They're very different. Climate change doesn't scare us like a disease does. A disease, we have uh, ingrained in our brain, in our collective memory, history of the pest, cholera, all of these epidemics, the Spanish flu, we have people in our families that died of it. So governments reacted like that. And now we need to say, okay, well, as the humanity is weakened, we are all weakened by COVID. We need to do everything we can so that we're not hit by yet another blow, which would be the climate change blow. So again, for me, that's the resilience and it's, I, I'm less pessimistic, maybe that's Celine. Uh, I think the, it's normal that the first investment of this post COVID will target money, rapid money making, hopefully good green infrastructures, but hopefully the second wave of investment is going to be one about resilience thinking. And how can we use the lessons from the COVID to make our populations uh, better equipped to withstand the as dangerous impact of climate change as of COVID? And we know one thing, government can act, and that's great. We mm. did not know that very much, you know. So, but now we know they can. When they want, they can. And so let, let's turn to uh, recovery plans and financing of those recovery plans. Um, you know, we, we've, right from the beginning of the pandemic, but especially in the past couple of weeks, we've heard calls for, to use the opportunity of the pandemic response plans to incorporate inclusive, sustainable policymaking or for, you know, calls for uh, drastic, complete systems change. Um, and we already see a few initiatives doing so. I think of Hawaii's feminist economic recovery plan, for instance, or the momentum, the push for a global Green New Deal. Um, so what kind of local, national or global mechanisms, uh, what, what will be useful when it comes to innovative recovery plans? I know John, uh, you've championed the city, uh, especially uh, when it comes to pushing for action around the SDGs. Uh, what are the opportunities here, local versus global uh, response? Well, I would just wanna first say, I think that we have, I would only echo what Jeff was raising in terms of testing, tracing, and isolation. Like it's, you know, I mentioned we have to think about everything. I talked about the checklist, but there are a critical path set of questions here. And if we're not doing the testing, the contact tracing, the isolation, and hopefully treatment soon enough, as that evolves with the quick evolution of science, we're not gonna get to talk about a lot of questions soon enough. Uh, in a practical sense. So, I mean, 
I think that the tracing in particular, I am most worried about uh, as the great missing gap in so much of the global response. And that requires responses at all levels. So it's a community question. It's a provincial question in Canada, of course, given the division of labor uh, between the public health uh, authorities and the national ones. Uh, but we simply can't skip that question en route to these others. When we mm -hmm. think about the others, I think one of the big, <laughs> interesting, crucial things right now is we have a bit of a mismatch, despite the extraordinary dedication of so many multilateral leaders right now. And, you know, at a personal level, these people are, uh, so many of them acting so heroic. But we have a mismatch between what the world is willing to do in cooperation and a problem that exactly has been said can't be solved without cooperation. And so it's the quintessential public good challenge that I'm not better unless you're better. And mm -hmm. so we all have to make sure everyone is better. And that is uh, something that will require many new forms of cooperation, I anticipate, and many new forms of quote unquote multilateralism. That means cities for sure, where we see many cities are at the forefront of pioneering, uh, you know, whether it's changing their transport policies or opening up roads uh, to bike lanes or just shutting down, uh, you know, various aspects that people said, oh, we never had a moment to do it. Now we have a moment to do it. But there are other aspects of community orientation when people won't be traveling for a good while, probably, where people can think differently about how communities actually intersect and interact. But we have a huge set of questions also around things like, how do we set our budgets? We have a lot of people who care about their well-being in general right now. There's been a well-being movement in many places. Uh, and, you know, how do we go beyond GDP? Well, we all know GDP isn't so useful if you don't have a good public health system right now. You know, it's derivative, not driver. And so we have to be, I think we can be thinking at the federal and provincial policy levels about, what are we budgeting to? What are we tracking? How do we have sustainability of human and environmental aspects built in, like a bunch of countries have been pioneering? And then crucially, we can think about how there could be forms of cooperation at different levels globally. So the most, in my view, absurd aspect of this is we had different jurisdictions, sometimes different companies, provinces, states, cities, countries, all competing for so-called personal protective equipment. Whereas in the global development space, we've learned a lot about pooled procurement of basic commodities in the past 20 years and how to do that very efficiently so they get at low cost to the right place at the right time. So what would it look like, for example, to have a cooperative structure for different entities to be part of pool procurement for personal protective equipment that they could draw upon when they need it, whether they're a city, whether they're a hospital, whether they're a province, a state, or what have you, or a federal government. And I think these are the types of problem-focused cooperation that needs an all of the above strategy in terms of who's part of it. Thank you. Thanks, John. And we just have a few minutes left. I want to get to a, a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll, and we seem to have lost Celine. Hopefully, she'll join us back uh, in a moment. But um, and I'll look out for her, her there. Um, but um, just very quickly before we get to a, a couple of audience questions, uh, and I, I know it's uh, it's it's hard to to simplify. But any wish lists for uh, building back better? You know, we have ten years in the next ten years. What is going to make or break? Uh, you, again, this is, you know, a, a, a very tricky question to answer simply, but, you know, if you can think of some concrete things that would be on your wish list, whether it's policies or for um, researchers or the general public, what, what would be, what comes to mind that you hope is going to stay front of mind? Um, Kathleen? For, yeah, for me, it's very clearly rejoice to pay income tax that pay a public health system mm. and a public education system. Be proud of that and stop that discourse that say $300 more at the end of your year will make you richer when what makes you richer is that there's no poor and needs in your country. So, so I hope very much that we can value our systems that value the life of every one of us in our country. And I wish we extend that to other country and we are able to 
be a global citizen as a country at the same time as we care for our own. Maybe I'll just add, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, and I'm happy to see, by the way, the mayor of Victoria from my home province of British Columbia is on the line. You know, we have so many local leaders uh, who are contributing to this. The notion of uh, robustness, not just resilience, but true robustness, I would hope, comes through everything, what we do on the policy side in our different levels, orders of government, at an organizational side, what types of shocks are we able to withstand? Uh, we need a very different mindset for robustness of everything we're doing every day. Uh, part of that, I would say, is, you know, we talked about things like the, the government uh, budgeting, proc pool procurement, even how government itself procures across the different orders of government can set huge standards. Uh, and we've seen that debate on the climate side in Canada just this week. But globally, I think we have to think very differently about what we're investing in too in our global robustness. Because if we add up, I did a study a couple of years ago, we added up all the different budgets for all the different multilateral institutions, 50 plus of them. We spend about $60 billion a year on all of them, peacekeeping, disease control, environmental management, you know, uh, this is uh, anti-poverty, food relief in the poorest countries on the multilateral side. That's about $8 per person for the world for all its problems. Now, one of the silver linings of this crisis is that people now are getting used to talking about trillions of dollars, which in a certain sense makes sense because we're in $90 trillion global economy. And if we were just spending 1% a year on robustness in shared efforts, that would be 900 billion, not 60. And so I think many of these things we need to actually just, not just double or triple down, but even sometimes 10 times down to build our outcome oriented robustness to solve the practical problems rather than just process problems. And that's where I think Canada has done very well on many aspects of its domestic response, not perfect, but very well. And we need to help, you know, the rest of the world figure out how to do well on its global response too. Um. Two quick questions from the audience. Uh, one from Sienna. She asks, how, "How much global, how much global progress do you see reversing as a result of the pandemic?" And then I'll take another one from Luis. How can we increase awareness about the interconnectedness of the SDGs? So, any any global progress that you might see reversing, and um, how do we increase awareness, Catherine? So. Yes, um, I'm running a project called Pivot. It's on Facebook, you can look for it. Uh, it is a, a project that is looking at how SMEs are responding to COVID and climate change. And we started that because we thought there would be a, a lot of going backward. If you're an SME, a small and medium sized enterprise, you're threatened, your own existence is threatened by COVID. You're gonna say, heck, the environment, heck, climate change, that's not at all what's happening. Everybody, is feeling even stronger about their desires. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of backward going, at least I hope not. I think people will just uh, be confirmed in the importance of sustainability and fighting climate change to avoid other hits. So I would be really positive. I, I, sorry, I must jump in. I've just been given the warning that this meeting actually will go into the breakout room to continue the discussion. Uh, it may close without warning, so I just wanted to jump in and say thank you so much. I'm so sorry it's, it's rushed at the end, um, but for all of the audience joining us, uh, we, we can continue this discussion and you can bring your questions in. Um, so thanks. Uh, we, we did fit in a lot of uh, context there in a very short period of time, um, so thank you to Celine. Uh, Kathleen, John, and to the organizers, and thanks again.